The views expressed in this podcast are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of MedPep or Physician Health Services. The advice given to Marie Curious has been individualized and may not apply to the listener. While Marie Curious is a real person describing both real and hypothetical events and situations, she is using a pseudonym for this series. Welcome to MedPEP, the Medical Professionals Empowerment Program. I'm Dr. Les Schwab, the host of MedPEP. I'm a practicing internist, an experienced medical leader, and a trained professional coach. I strive to help healthcare professionals, leaders, and others in our field develop strategies for helping them cope with the complexity in today's exceedingly demanding and stressful practice environment. I'm here to serve as the guide for my young colleague, Dr. Marie Curious an early career primary care internist with a large and demanding practice here in Massachusetts. Marie is determined not only to survive, but to thrive in this difficult environment. In each MedPEP session, I facilitate a conversation between Marie and an expert with knowledge and skills to help her optimize and navigate her experience practicing medicine. Today's expert is Dr. Danielle Ofrey, who will speak to us on the topic of what patients say, what doctors hear. But before we begin, I'd like to ask Marie if she can catch us up, if she has any reflections about things at this point. Thanks, Les. Always a pleasure to be here with you. Something that I've been thinking more about is how very complex it is to survive and thrive as we've been talking. Before, I really thought at the start of the series, it's going to be a few tricks up my sleeve, a few things I can put into practice and I'll feel great going in to practice every day and I'll be able to do this for 30 more years. But <laughs> as I've practiced more, and actually because of this series that we're doing together, it's a lot more complicated than I first thought. There's a lot of internal work to be done, that's for sure, and self-care, but there's a lot of external forces as well. Well, I think we've tried to navigate this series to address both sides of it, both, right. both the self-management and insights and skills that it will help to feel capable and easier about taking care of patients, but also how you might interact and change the environment we're in, both the local environment with one's peers, as well as begin to question the system that is indeed contributing to all this complexity. That's right. So I'm very interested to hear your conversation that you're about to have with Danielle. Dr. Ofri, welcome to the program. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. May I call you Danielle? Absolutely. What do you do in general, and specifically, what do you do to help the lot of us physicians? Well, I'm a, like you, a primary care doctor. I work in the medical clinic at Bellevue Hospital in New York. It's a large public hospital academic center, and, and I see adult patients with the range of medical and health conditions. On my sort of other side, my other hat, I'm a writer. And what interests me the most is what we do in the everyday work of medicine, how we connect with our patients, how we explain medicine to them, and how we survive in our own lives. So I tend to pick up on things that affect our everyday lives. So for example, I had a terrible experience getting a prior authorization for patients' medications that weren't covered. And it, it so impacted me that I wanted to write about it because I think, I know my colleagues share that. Today I was in clinic this morning and we have a new e-prescribe in our electronic medical record. And I was completely sunk writing a Robitussin prescription. I almost <laughs> was jumping out the window for cough medicine over the counter. And only like my fellow you know, physicians can really get that you could be suicidal over <laughs> trying to write Robitussin. It really, it's just, I couldn't get to go through. And, and although you kind of laugh at some of those things, but they do impact our care because they really change the nature of how we practice medicine and make it harder to take care of patients, which is why we all want to be there. I mean, no one went into medicine to make a million dollars or to get all the fame and glory, but we love working with patients. And so even these little annoyances, they're meaningful because they detract from really the meat of medicine. So I've been thinking about how can we make our time with patients better? So when I worked on my last book, What Patients Say, What Doctors Hear, I was thinking about doctor-patient communication really in two ways. One is just that it's the most important part of medicine, certainly for cognitive medical people like internists and pediatricians. You know, we're not doing procedures every day. That is what we do, and that's the most of it. But then also 
how we experience medicine as physicians, because that is the most rewarding part. I think most of us find the documentation really the dry part and the part talking with patients the best part. So that's kind of my platform of how I sort of think about these things. And I'm happy to go into more detail, but maybe I'll stop there so I don't keep going too much. No, thank you. That was a very helpful overview. And I think you hit the nail on the head there that probably most people in primary care don't go in for the money, that's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we do go into it because we care about people at the core of it, not just their medical issues, but their whole being. And so I've always enjoyed hearing patient stories. And that's you know, the humanistic part of medicine. But to be honest, all the pressures that we have these days, literally a timer at our back to finish the patient exchange, close the encounters on time, put in the orders, communicate with this person and that, I find myself wanting to cut to the chase probably every minute I'm in with a patient. How do I go back to being a better listener and still get out on time to do the things I have to do in life. One thing I I try to help, especially with my students and interns, to not view the patient stories as, oh, that's sort of like the fun, nice side of medicine as distinct from the meat part of doing the medical care. Because I think the patient stories are really part of the medical care, even if they seem like they're off topic. In fact, it's a goldmine of diagnostic clues and therapeutic clues and issues for how to do care and how to be quote, efficient, often being efficient is hearing those stories. I had a patient who just kept coming in with his medications a mess. And I spent every visit sorting through the med list and cleaning it up and printing out this brand new spanking clean med list. And I'm great at meeting all my hospital requirements. You know, it took two years till he finally confided to me that he can't read. Mm. And I missed that. And so I wasn't being very efficient because I didn't actually delve into his background. In fact, that really impacted his medical care. It wasn't just the nice, uh, sappy, you know, touchy-feely part of medicine. It was a critical part. And had I taken taken the time for a stronger social history, including his educational background, we would have saved two years of terribly controlled diabetes. So it was my first message is that that part is critical. It is medical care. And of course, we have to make that case to our higher up. That is part and parcel and not just a side, nice helping, you know, that comes afterward. So the other approach I try to do is I try to take the first minute of my visit to kind of ignore the EMR, focus on the patient and get that full frontal listening stuff that we love and, and not interrupt the patient. You know, a minute of focused listening is actually a lot of time for a patient and nearly every patient can get at what they want to say in that one minute. And that minute, besides getting more accurate information and not interrupting and, and chasing down the first thing out of the patient's mouth and missing the second thing, which could be, oh, I think I had a stroke last week that we might miss. But also the patient knows you're listening and that investment in trust is a huge payoff. And I wrote about a patient of mine. I had done an experiment. What would happen if I just didn't interrupt a patient to let them talk as long as they can? And I was, all my colleagues were like, oh, that's, you can't do that. You'll never get done in time. But in fact, most patients, you know, clocked in it at under a minute. You know, they really said what they had to say. And then I came to the dreaded patient with every psychosomatic issue, every anxiety and depression and difficult mother and difficult son and, you know, that kind of patient. I thought, oh, God, we'll never get out of here. But I, I let her talk and she went on with every organ of her body, you know, <laughs> and her mother's doctors, you know, the whole nine <laughs> yards. In the end, it took four minutes. You know, I thought it was an hour, but it was only four minutes. And once we got everything down, then we could make a plan. We could talk about which things today, which things we'll leave for next time. It made it much easier. Thereafter, our visits were much more efficient. But moreover, a patient said to me, something I've read about, but I never actually heard a patient say. She said, just talking about all this has made me feel better. Mm -hmm. And I think for those very difficult patients, in fact, taking even the extra minute or two can be quite therapeutic. And of course, that's what we're in the business to do, to make our patients feel better. And for these patients, for whom a lot of their issues, their pain derives from things that we can't control as physicians, they're psychosocial, they're economic, they're all these things, that alone is, is worth remembering to take the extra minute or two. And most patients don't even take that long. So I try to, I tell my students, take that first minute. And then I'll say something like, you know, 
uh, Mrs. Jones, I don't want to miss what you're saying. Would you mind if I took notes while you speak? And then I've gotten the patient's permission and I acknowledge the computer. Listen, they, they know it's got to be there. But then it's not quite so bad because they haven't lost me to the computer. They've had my attention. And now we loop in the computer. And if I can, I tilt the screen toward them to sort of focus. Because, yes, I, I need to cut to the chase. But even that one minute alone can, can make it work. Or I'll say, you know, what are the three things you want to talk about? You pick two things. I'll pick one thing. The rest we'll get to next time. So I let them know I haven't ignored them. But we'll get to that next time. I can't do it all because we can't do 36 things in one visit. Yeah, and Danielle, I'm so glad that was just full of gems. I <laughs> I can't even begin to unpack it. But I think a few of the things that I hear you say, and I wanted to articulate and confirm that this indeed is first a practice, that listening takes practice, and also that this is... Like you say, it's not just the soft, fluffy stuff, but it's the meat of what the patient is actually concerned about. But it's also not letting them dictate the agenda. And I say that because you actually mentioned just now that part of what you do is not just listen to them, whether it's for one minute or four minutes, but then you actually then prioritize what the important issues are for that day. Like you said, well, let's talk about this and this today and, and we'll need to have you come back to discuss this, that, and the other thing. And I think that's something that will take a lot of time to develop. Do you feel that you have gotten better at it over the years? I have, and especially because I tell my patient, sometimes they'll unsnap that list of 40 things. <laughs> and I'll say, you know, if we do all 40 things today, by definition, single one will be superficial. And I don't want to shortchange your concerns because it's not fair. If we just give it 10 seconds, I'm not, we're not going to get to the bottom of it. So to give you the best experience, let's pick the most important ones, you know, and you pick two and I make sure I get to pick one. So I pull up the chest pain or whatever the one I want to make sure gets there. And that way I've given them a rationale, not that I'm too busy for you or I've got better things to do than listen to you. I don't want to make it superficial. So I'll say that to my patient. In fact, we've just tried an experiment in our clinic where we give the patient a sheet of paper in the waiting room with a list of three things. Mm -hmm. Please list the three things you want to talk about. And so we even have a starting point for that. And that a little bit preempts, you can't fit 20 things on the page. And so that's a helpful thing. But yes, you do have to set some limits, but letting the patient know the reason you're doing it and that's in their benefit you're doing it, not because you're trying to you know, cut them off is very helpful. That's right. And I think part of what you're saying is that the listening aspect is what we do as physicians in obtaining that history, that it's not just an implied passiveness to it. Sure. This isn't a great comparison, but it's not therapy where people can just sort of talk on end, but there is a direction and perhaps we can pull out the key points from what the patient is saying. Oh, absolutely. I had a patient this morning who has many psychosocial issues. And so I was trying to elicit a little bit. It was like therapy, but I was looking for signs of domestic violence or That's abuse. Right. In there, but I, trying to pull out her experience. Tell me about what you, she said she talks to herself. So I want to know, is that hallucinations? Is that meditation? And so it's on the border, but you're right. It's distinctly not therapy. And it's very much, I, I have my agenda and then I will move it when I think we, we need to move. Hmm. And Danielle, one question that does come to my mind and something you've alluded to earlier is that so much of what patients ail from, so to speak, is family problems, social economic stressors, work or joblessness, insurance issues. I've been more and more faced with one of the main questions, for example, today, I often, like you, try to elicit an agenda from the patient's perspective and say, what do you want to talk about today? But one of their top questions was an insurance question. And I just have no idea how to answer those. How do you, oh. how do you approach that? I'm honest. I say, I wish I had the answer to that. <laughs> you know, that's a critical question. But I won't, I won't make a self-deprecating joke. We doctors are the last to know, you know, and right. these sorts of things. Or they'll ask me, how much will the CAT scan cost? Yes. And I'll just come flat out and say, I have no idea. If I even hazard to guess I'm off. So when you're done here, let me tell you where the social worker is. Mm. Or I know calling your insurance company is really a hard thing to do, but that's the only place you can get an answer. And, and I apologize for punting, but I'll be upfront because right, there's no point. It is a waste of everyone's time for a doctor to wade into the insurance mess. <laughs> but I'll acknowledge how frustrating it is and, and how frightening. And I, and I tend to 
want to figure out what's the big issue in the patient's life aside from their illnesses. Is it the sick child in their home country? Is it the aging parent? Something. Mm -hmm. And I note that in the past medical history, because I know that if I don't address that first, at least initially, because I have a patient with, with an ill child in her home country whom she can't go visit because of immigration issues. And that is the most important thing in her life. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really care about her diabetes as mm -hmm. much as I do. Mm -hmm. But I need to ask about how the daughter is doing, and then we can get to the diabetes. Mm -hmm. So yes, maybe it sounds like, oh, I'm just doing the little internist chit chat, but I'm not. I know that I must get there, and then we can go to the diabetes. So I use these things strategically, and I keep them in my chart who's raising a grandchild because the child's in jail, whose husband, you know, has been an alcoholic, and that's really the big thing. Make a nod to that. Don't let it go into the half an hour thing. But I think for the patients that you remember, what was the big thing on their mind is an enormous thing because then they know, okay, this is someone who's mm -hmm. listening. And once they know you're listening to them, they're much more willing to trust you. In fact, the patient I was referred to before who's having some anxiety issues, she's seeing a therapist, said, but I haven't told them about my father yet or about the talking to myself, but she told me. So I've had a little more time than the therapist has to get, get in there. And so if we really listen, our patients will then trust us with the things, psychosocial, sexual complaints, eating disorders, things they might not bring up, but which are critically important to their medical care. I will agree, Daniel. I think that the conversation with the patient is both a rich, rich source of contextual knowledge as well as a kind of bonding for an empathic relationship. Very, very rich. But I have a question here. In order to free one's attention and give the time to this less structured, more receptive, but guided listening, we're going to have to unlearn some things. We're going to have to unlearn that H and P. We're going to have to ignore the computer screen, which has all the unfilled checklists staring at us in the face at the same time. We also have to learn to ignore the ticking of the clock, thinking about what else we have to do today. So I wondered if you had any suggestions, A, how to unlearn the habit of this programmed non-listening interview that we were trained and is somewhat expected, and then how to deal with tensions that might arise when the other demands are felt. Sure. So so the, the biggest thing to unlearn that I've really had to force myself is not interrupt with the first question in your head. Patients, I have this pain here, right? And we jump in, oh, when did it start? When did it stop? Makes it better, makes it worse. I go right in, right? And that's a really tough one to sit on your hands for those first even 30 seconds. That is the toughest one. But once you do that and let the patient talk, you get much better data. And I remind my students that what the patient's saying to you, that is hard data. He's called subjective. No, it's the data. They said they have a cough. They don't admit to a cough. They have a cough. They said they have a cough. They've got a cough. <laughs> and I don't need to have an FBI to check if they really are coughing at home, right? That's it. They have a cough. <laughs> and so I, I try to tell my students to forget the admit, deny kind of thing. It's like a B-movie courtroom drama. So that's the data they give me. You know, there are probably a subset of patients with severe mental illness issues for whom it might be not reliable. But most patients, they have a cough. They've got a cough. So I try to really sit on my hands about jumping in. That's the hardest one for me. The other thing is to remind myself, my students, that multitasking doesn't really exist, right? We, we can't do two things at once. We jump back and forth and we lose accuracy. So you are more efficient, you know, to single task. And so though the computers is tempting with flashing things, that is making you less efficient. And so I try to single task. And with the patient, you can easily make the ethical argument that this is the primary person you're focusing on. Everything else is less important. The second way that I try to be efficient is that I use the physical exam in another manner now. I mean, true, the physical exam maybe is less important in some of the structural ways. We're probably less good at it than our, our forebears, and we have easier access to CTs and MRIs. But the exam is still important, obviously, although honestly, I think as we all know, we use it more to verify things. We rarely find something in physical exam that we didn't have a hint about in history. So it's really confirmatory. But I find the physical exam as my second chance on the interview that when we're sitting at the desk, there's a computer between us, people have phones between us. When we get to the exam table, that's the time when it's two humans with no technology between us. And Countless times, that's when the patient says what's really on their mind. So again, I use the physical exam strategically to continue my interview. And often, whether they're reminded of how their stomach, oh, you know, I'm having these stomach issues, or that they feel more relaxed, and they may then admit to the eating disorder, something that's been uncomfortable to say 
sitting at the desk, but now on the exam table, because once you're touching, this is an intimacy. You know, it's not a romantic one, but it is intimate and it changes the dynamics. And many patients, I find that's where they will then speak to you more deeply. So I use that time to continue my interview and maybe probe some of the more challenging issues. So I get double my money on the physical exam. And then I guess the third thing is just to remind the world around you that, you know, this is the most important thing and don't interrupt unless someone is having a cardiac arrest in the waiting room. Other than that, you know, it it can always wait. You don't want to be interrupted when you're with a patient and please don't interrupt me if at all possible and turn off the pager if you can. So I hear a combination of strategies. One is to be strategic with the use of the time, both in the talking time and the physical time. One is to reframe the time instead of saying, I can't multitask. This full frontal listening is the most important thing I'm going to do and allow the other noise to sort of move to the periphery. And then also to interact with the environment in ways to guarantee the integrity of the time available to the extent one can. So I have another question then, which is we practitioners do not live in a teaching environment where there's a chance to be instructed in these skills or get reinforcement. What are your suggestions about where to begin if one is a busy practicing internist and not currently in a learning environment? It's very challenging. Even those of us in academic environment, once we're out of our training days, no one is giving us feedback and evaluations. And I I wrote about this a bit when I had the experience, which I still do, of of taking music lessons. I've been taking the cello, taking cello lessons for the last 11 years, 12 years now. And I noticed quite the difference in that with medicine, you know, after I got out of residency and the training, things sort of plateaued. You know, I learned a little bit here and there, but not like I was as a student. Whereas in my music lessons, every week I'm being pushed to move further and further up on the ladder because I have a teacher who's giving me feedback, not letting me fall on the plateau and pushing me forward. And I I wondered if that isn't the reason some of the sort of mid-career angst and burnouts related to our sort of lack of feedback and learning and that sort of joy of even the hard work and challenge of learning. That's just also a very fulfilling experience. And I feel like we can learn you know, a, a lot. There was an article in the Annals, which is what prompted me to write my article by Frank Davidoff called What Doctors Can Learn from Musicians, because musicians are constantly getting feedback and we don't really have much opportunity for that. In the ideal world, you can get yourself videotaped once and watch yourself doing an interview, which is fascinating. First time I did, I wrote all kinds of things that I had. Like, for example, I learned that whenever I think deeply, I close my eyes. Hmm. My patients must think I'm like falling asleep on there and get coffee. And, and even that one time of, of seeing myself was very informative. But you can also end up having to sort of do your own feedback and you can try some different things. Like what happens when I don't interrupt my patient with a polypositive review of systems? You know, how does that work out in the end? And you can say, did I, did I actually get a better experience? Did I walk out feeling better? Did I work out feeling worse? Like for the patient I cited before, not only did she feel better, I actually felt better because I normally, and we all, we hate these patients, right? They're, you know, difficult. We can't solve their problems. And that was the first time I actually felt like I was making progress with her, that I wasn't just rearranging deck chairs. And so having that little bit of my own feedback that I felt better after having let her talk those full four minutes, let me know that I could use that again and it'll make me feel less stressed in, in the moment. So your own feedback I mean, some people try to get feedback from their patients from other clinicians, but in practice, I know that that's next to impossible. I wondered if you are aware of any practice rather than teaching situations where there has been an institutional effort to cultivate better listening. I don't. I only know really of individuals. I think certainly some medical settings. I think it depends a lot on the leader. I'll tell you, today is the day one we have a new CEO of our entire public hospital corporation, and they're hiring for the first time a physician who's a primary care doctor. And that's really exciting that the person at the top is not just a suit, I won't say just, but you know, an administrator, someone who, <laughs> and who actually still sees patients. And, and that alone, I think, this is person who understands primary care, who sees patients, who knows what it's like to, to be there, I think that will hopefully set a different direction. So the leadership can really make a difference, but it's very individual, it really requires people at the top to care. But if the whole practice comes together and says, you know, this is what we think is important, you, we can influence certainly some things. Like in our practice, the prior authorization thing w- was sinking many doctors, and we finally got a PA 
dedicated to prior authorizations. And that was an enormous change. And I think for the benefit of patients, because it took a enormous chunk off our shoulders, we could then give that time to patients. Well, let me begin to summarize, but also tip my hat to you, Danielle, because I think in your capacity as a writer, that offers leaders the chance to absorb the worth of new and progressive ideas that it's hard to argue from the trenches for. But if you can get into their mind space with the notion that this is really a valuable use of the physician's time and it needs to be accorded the training and support it deserves, yeah, that would I be great. If I say there's two words, two phrases that we can use with administrators. One is patient satisfaction and one is patient safety. And so when you frame them this way, because the administrators care a lot about patient satisfaction now with H caps and F caps and all, all these things. And so what makes patients satisfied? It's not the fancy coffee maker in the waiting room. It's being seen on time and having a doctor or nurse who really is listening to them. That makes the patients happy. So if we can show them the data about that and make that appeal, that speaks to them. And the second is patient safety. And so we talk about when we don't have a chance to talk to patients, it is dangerous, right? If we're being forced to type while we're listening to them and we can make more errors or, you know, there's many ways to make the case, but patient safety and of course loss is the language that administrators speak. So I use those two lenses to make my case when I'm talking to someone who's not a clinician. Well, I think that is a value proposition that could be articulated at any level to one's immediate supervisor or all the way up to the CEO. So let me summarize a bit of this conversation. You've given us some valuable affirmation that taking time with the patients is the most important thing that we do, particularly listening to get the full richness and offering they're giving us in their stories. That we do have some latitude to govern the conversation, but it is a matter of creating the sequence with the patient so that we can get to the important things and avoid cramming too many things superficially into the time and avoid too much multitasking, which will just make the tasks at hand superficial. That you also told us that we can learn to reframe this conversation as opposed to the traditional data gathering, history and physical checklist kind of thing that the environment's demanded. We can sit down and reframe the task to ourselves that it is also worth defending that to uh, the persons in our environment, whether it's our practice environment or elsewhere in the institution. You also made the point about the physicians do need an opportunity for mid-career learning feedback in order to revitalize their sense of their everyday tasks. I think that's a really good insight. And that for many, the best available insight is simply to use their own reflection, to take the time to reflect about how things are going, what they've learned, where new things may emerge from the interactions they've had. So I think that's all really, really good stuff for the everyday practitioner. Yeah, and let me add, if you really want to feel rejuvenated about medicine, make a house call to a one of your frail patients. I, I just made a house call to a patient two days before Christmas. She was end stage cancer and dying. I didn't think she would make it the week I was going to be away. And that visit alone, I'll tell you, I know it takes time. I did it on, on a weekend, but it's so reaffirmed why we're in medicine. And of course I knock my head, why do we always wait till the patient at the end of their life to do this? It's, it's amazing. And even one or two of those a year make you feel good about what you're doing. If you're feeling dejected or frustrated, pay a house call to an elderly housebound patient and you'll be back in your saddle pretty quickly. I agree with that and fortunately my work allows me to do some of that as well. So I, I thoroughly endorse the notion. So, Marie, I wondered if you had any reflection about what you've heard from Danielle and whether you might see an opportunity to put it into practice. I think everything said so far basically captures what I aim to do in my own practice. And I was just wondering in my own mind how long it would take me to get to where Danielle is. And I'm wondering if that's 10, 20, or 30 years or never. But I will strive to do so. I think it's a continuous process of improvement. That's right. You know, like all human relationships, doctor-patient is one. They're infinitely perfectible. There is no end point. You just keep going. And one question that I had in my own mind, and this is a work in progress, and I 
I don't multitask well, and I have identified that, Danielle, and I do focus in on the patient during the, the clinic visit, but is it at all possible to actually then shave down even more on patient interaction time, which I don't wanna do, in order to get my documentation and inbox work done that follows? Because for every 10 minutes I spend with the patient, I probably spend 10 minutes on the other end, and so that literally doubles my work time. And I, I think I'm pretty efficient. And so that might be a Pandora's box for next time, but that's where my thought process is going. Yeah. Well, I, I can, can I add one tip on that? Absolutely. So, so we have a new e-prescribe system, which is incredibly laborious. Whoever wrote it was not a doctor. It's a nightmare. <laughs> so two strategies I have is one is I make a big joke and laugh at myself and how you know inefficient I am, like what a luddite I am. And so a patient and I can, we can both crack up together lightens the atmosphere, acknowledges the problem, and then I do it with them. I said, okay, boy, this is gonna take us forever, but here, I wanna go through every medication one by one at the rate of a dinosaur's pace, but I can pull them into some of that boring documentation, make it part of the visit, have a good laugh at myself, and do it with the patient in the room. So that way, I'm still with the patient, I've acknowledged them, and I do some of it with them in the room and just make it seem like, isn't this pretty funny and ridiculous? Let's go through this morass together. And we can chat in between it and I can pick up other details in between. Okay, another, another technique to try. Thank you, Danielle. Sure. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you for a really interesting conversation today, as well as thank our listening audience for tuning in. And we look forward to our next conversation, which will be with Dr. Stephen Edelman, and our topic will be looking for relief in the wrong places. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you, Les. And you're welcome. If you have a question or a comment about today's program, email us at feedback at medpep.org or simply visit us at medpep.org. And now here's a few words from MedPep's founder, Steve Edelman. This is Dr. Steve Edelman, creator of MedPep, the Medical Professionals Empowerment Program, and director of PHS, Physician Health Services, a charitable subsidiary of the Massachusetts Medical Society. Our mission is to promote the well-being of health professionals. Many thanks to our seeker, Dr. Marie Curious, to our guide, Dr. Les Schwab, and to our wonderful group of guest experts. Hats off to project leader Dr. J. Dev Dasgupta, audio producer Douglas Stevens, guitardiologist Dr. Susie Brown, and to the staff and board of PHS. Please visit and connect with us at medpep.org for CME info, faculty bios, and additional empowerment resources.